to, sir. Yeah. Where are, are you live on YouTube, guys? Righty ho. Okay. Um, so, welcome everybody to Strategy and Performance Scrutiny Board, second uh, of June, two thousand twenty-one. Uh, we're under new management at the moment. Uh, this is the first time I've chaired this particular scrutiny board and um, Councillor Bob Metcalf is the deputy chair and I think it's the first time that uh, Bob's been on that as well. So uh, okay. I suppose that could be good and bad, having a mixture of people uh, on here, new people. We've also got a, a few new uh, councillors, Jacob, uh, Councillor Jacob Cook, I think he's a new councillor and new on the board. Uh, and we've got... we. Uh, would we've got yes, Stephen Lee, Councillor Stephen Lee, who I think is new on this one, uh, and blah, 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 Dan Sutherland, you're, you're new on this one as well, aren't you, Councillor Sutherland? So, uh, welcome and enjoy. Um, <laughs> just a general bit of admin. Um, this, as I've said, this is the first time I've um chaired. A, com a committee like this size on Zoom. So I'm going to be struggling to see everybody and work through that. So in the first instance, please, can you use a physical raised hand? Um, so I'm more likely to be able to see that if you wish to speak. Uh, and I've got a couple of other people who are going to be helping out if I miss you. So they'll shout at me um, so that I manage to include you in things. Um, so uh, let's get on with the meeting in that case. Um, Substitutes, what substitutes do we have for the meeting, please? Right. We have um, Councillor Megan Swift and apologies from Councillor Naeem for whom she's subbing chair. Great, thank you very much. Uh, so we've already said hello, Megan, well done, uh, subbing here. Uh, members' interests, uh, could we remind members to uh, uh, disclose any pecuniary or other interests? either now or later on in the meeting as and when required. Um, please do that. Um, as far as the admission of the public is concerned, it's not recommended that the public be excluded from the meeting. Uh, so it, it's open and uh, those of you who are managing to join us on uh, 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 YouTube will be able to do so throughout the meeting. The first uh, substantive item on the, men men on the menu, on the uh, agenda is the minutes. Uh, and I remind members that the minutes are for two meetings, the 24th of February and the 24th of March. Um, any questions or comments on those minutes, please? Bob, you, I can see your hand, you're on my screen, away you go. Right. Yeah, thank you, Chair. It, it, it's, j just want to check, uh, looking at those minutes, reading through them, there are some uh, matters ongoing. Um, and I'm just wondering at what point we can discuss any matters arising, seeing we don't have it specifically as an agenda item. Um, are, we, are we taking them now or are we taking them at, when we further on in the agenda when we're looking at... Our, Let's our take agenda. them initially now, just if you could raise them. Uh, and if they look like taking a long time, we might have to do something else about them. But um, fire away, please, on the, the items you're referring well, to. Very, very quickly, when I've read through them, of course, it's the first time I've been reading through these. I mean, it's yeah. before, but, but in, in the two months, there's, 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 I think there's three items I just wanted to quickly mention then. Uh, the first one is the, um, I'm not sure, on the 24th of Feb meeting, I think it was, that was the, um, that was the update regarding the elections and the process for this year's elections. Uh, obviously, this year's elections more difficult than previous years um, with COVID and uh, preparations and, and uh, the big increase in postal votes. I'm, I'm asking the question, it, do, does this uh, board get a feedback after an election as to any, um, you know, comments that the election uh, staff like would like to bring to us um, about the performance of the election procedure this year? I just thought it's, you know, is it a learning process that they come back and say just what, what issues have arisen, if any? It sounded as though it's gone very well indeed, but I'm just checking if that's if there is a mm. feed, feedback from an election to this to this board. Mike, as it's my first new one, are you aware of, has that happened in the past? I, I think it has from time to time, and I think Governance and Business Committee also sort of reviewed oh, the elections. Right. But there's, there's the, I think you've got two options, Chair, or, or, or board. One is there's nothing to stop you putting it on the agenda for the next meeting. Uh, mm. And if you wanted to uh, get a quick response, uh, Ian Hughes is going to be attending later, and he will... 
probably be the best person to report back on the, you know, what went well and what went less well, which you may be able to do verbally or you could add it to your agenda if you choose to. Indeed. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Thanks, Mike. Bob, is um, that OK for now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Got. The, the other quick items then, uh, on the 24th of, 24th of March, uh, the uh, procurement and social value uh, um, uh, report, um, I think it was asked to go on the June cabinet, which I don't believe it did, um, okay. on themes and measures and key stages to be built in. Uh, I just wanted to know just how, how that's going to be progressed. Yes, that was an item I was going to, to, to raise. Um, Mike, any thoughts on that? Well, just, just we've got Councillor Lee. I think Councillor Lee's trying to get in, Chair. Oh, sorry. Okay. Councillor Thank Lee. you, Chair. Um, it might be that that method doesn't work because I've been waving frantically. Um, before we moved well, on, to, I just before we moved there. on to this, the second item that, that Councillor Metcalf mentioned. In, in can I just put in there and say I can only get nine people on the screen at any one time? So I'm, well, I'm it would be me, of course. Um, I, I'm asking people to keep an eye open, and Mike has mentioned it. So, but, but please fire away. Okay, it was just to try to be helpful and clarify your first the first point made by Councillor Metcalf. Today, I filled in a form as as an agent at, at the uh, at the count. Uh, uh, feedback for electoral services. So that there's a whole checklist of things. And as you might imagine, and I think you intimated, Bob, uh, in the circumstances, they did an extraordinary job. And any negatives, even perceived negatives, are hardly worth mentioning because we all hope we'll never have to do it like that again, of course. Uh, but I suspect that when all of those replies have come into electoral services, uh, we can ask them for a, a synopsis of what the uh, responses were and we'll get the feedback automatically if maybe Mike or someone uh, someone from uh, uh, Scrutiny Services could uh, make a note of that. Perhaps next time we'll get the results. Thank you. OK, thanks. Thanks, Stephen. Bob, carry on, please. Well, it was just on the... Yeah, um, I think that sounds fine. I think that's probably a right course of action to do. And... and uh, I, I agree with Councillor Lee. I'm sure it, it's what the elections were carried out in our usual brilliant and by the electoral staff in the usual brilliant way. But just back on the procurement to uh, social value matter, I just wanted to know just what, what when, when, when is it? Is this in? I, I don't think this is in the forward work programme, so perhaps we can bring it up then. Yeah, I think that would be a good time to do that. And we'll see if we include it. Mike, you wanted to come in there? Just, just, just to add that, I mean, since since that discussion, Councillor Bellinger, as the chair of this board at the time, did write to Councillor Swift asking uh, for this item to be on the on the agenda in June. But as, as you say, it clearly wasn't possible. Um, so that, that action was followed through following that meeting. Oh, yeah. Right. Thank you. The last one I think what? we have here is, uh, Jane, <clears throat> sorry to keep, take so much time up, where, uh, and I'm not just sure this. I'm not I don't know if this was on the minutes or not, but just just inquiring because I'm a bit unclear as to as to what's happening about this. And that was the scrutiny in the day on the green spaces. Mm. Uh, is that something we can just discuss at the on, on the work? Yes, uh, I've, I've received <clears throat> some information on that, Bob. It's taking a little bit longer to um, uh, do the full analysis of of the uh, of the information gathered. And uh, that will certainly be part, I think, of our uh, work programme to come. And I think Megan wants to add something there. Do you, Megan? Yeah, I do. And I'm taking this back to Bob's first question. Uh, I don't want to ask a question as a criticism because I think the elections team did a wonderful job. But I'd like to know what went wrong with the coastal vote and why it took so long where they were stuck in different places and post box, apparently. And I mean, it was nearly a week late with the ones we got. And I think that's general around. And okay. I hope somebody um, reported how they managed to do that because we will not want it to happen again. Yeah, okay. I think we'll have a note of that point. We'll include it in the overall review of the election process. Thank you for bringing that up. As coming back to Bob's point, yes, I think with the, the uh, green spaces thing will come up later on the action programme. 
uh, on, the, on what we're going to be dealing with uh, throughout the rest of the year. But thanks for bringing that up. Any other comments on the uh, minutes that people wish to raise? Issues or minutes? No, I can't. So, oh, Stephen, yes, I've scanned across to you this time. Away oh, you go. Greatly appreciated, Councillor Evans. Just to say, I agree with Megan's comments about the uh, postal uh, votes going out at different times. I included it on my uh, assessment, and I'm sure other agents would have done the same because pretty much all the wards will have been affected in some way or another by that. But uh, again, I think that in the circumstances that that happened, and I don't know that it's happened before. So let's hope that's not something we'll have to revisit. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so let's move on to item five, uh, the first of the items for discussion. Uh, this is the uh, financial overview and services prior service priorities. Um, the scrutiny board regularly receives uh, financial monitors, which are useful and helpful to scrutinise which departments are overspending and underspending. But by definition, these tend to be backward looking. Uh, I hope that this discussion will be forward looking and that we can discuss with Nigel some of the things that he's considering, including the next copy of the medium term financial strategy. So I'd like to look forward with these sorts of things. Um, it would be interesting to hear about the resource opportunities and resource challenges, particularly to as we start a long and probably slow recovery from pandemic. So I think that area is something that we need to be focusing on uh, in this particular uh, subject, but also perhaps throughout our, uh, our meetings. Um, particular in areas of interest for me, um, how healthy is Coverdale's economy now and how will that impact on our income from business rates, which obviously is a, a critical element of our income. Um, and as the ban on evictions end and individual citizens start their own economic recovery programme, how will that impact on council services and consequently on our future financial health? And understandably, we've had to spend much money in certain areas to respond to the needs of people and businesses during the pandemic. However, is this likely to continue? Uh, and has all of this been covered by government? And or is there a shortfall? So I think we need to be aware of those issues. And I guess that most scrutiny members will be thinking along those lines, will be aware of those issues. But I think that's something that we certainly need to bear in mind. And beyond the pandemic, um, what are the other financial pressures and opportunities which will be presented to us as we move on? Uh, and as the local plan becomes, becomes a reality, how will it change the financial landscape of uh, Calderdale, uh, as well as its actual landscape, I suppose? And as we now have a West Yorkshire mayor, are there any foreseeable financial impacts or indeed opportunities arising from this situation, because that's something new that we're going to need to take into account. And those sorts of issues, I'd like to think that we could cover, if not all of them in uh, today's presentation and meeting, but ongoing through these meetings that we have. So having done that little preamble, um, I'd like I've Nigel. Sorry, I've got Sorry. my, I've got Sorry, my hand up. And I have as well. Yeah, yeah. I was just, yeah, can right. I go so my right? Which one, Susan? Yeah. Uh, Megan first, please, and then yeah. Susan. I just wondered whether with the whole lot that you've covered there, whether we're getting yeah. rid of the, all the other scrutiny panels, and um, because they seem to come from all over, didn't they? Anyway, your turn, Susan. Um, Susan. Mine's a very simple question. I've had a lot of complaints from uh, people who haven't received their business uh, business recovery grants. Um, and I understand there is still a big backlog, backlog um, of grants waiting to be paid and I'd like to know where we are with that and how can we rebuild uh, confidence uh, in our business community because I, I, I honestly have been um, trying and trying and trying to get responses uh, from the appropriate departments and I've been banging my head against a brick wall. Thank you for that, Councillor uh, Press. I, I would agree with you. I've been uh, having some one, one or two problems in those sorts of areas as well. And I think that's something we should 
be looking at. Um, I think that it's partly my fault for having done a bit of a preamble on this, but I think we just need to be careful. We need to let Nigel do his full presentation and perhaps add those things on at the end of that so that we deal with that. But we need to note that and do something about it. Stephen, you're trying to get in as well. Thank you, Chair. Yes, it's just before the presentation, actually. Um, the very first uh, page has, has got a number of rankings in it. And um, it, it was just to ask Nigel before he starts the presentation on that, th on that table to, to, that uh, can you indicate how, how out of how many are those rankings? There's a number of them, 35th and that sort of magnitude. So are there 100 of them or are there 36 is the question. Thank Indeed. you. I think we should let Nigel get started rather than preempt him anymore. Nigel, over to you. Um, thank you very much, Chair. Yeah. And then just to answer the, the last question first, if, if that's okay, again, I want to answer the way that the, the ranking is compared to the 36 metropolitan districts. Um, so we can rank it against all local authorities and neighbouring ones, or the metropolitan districts have chosen the metropolitan districts, so it's out of 36. But I'll, I'll come on to that if I may. Um, so if it's okay, I'm not going to share the presentation because you've obviously had the chance to have a look through it. Perhaps if I can just spend five minutes taking you through the key points, if, if that's okay, Chair? Please do, yes, please and, do. And then I'll, I'll try to pick up any questions at the end. Um, so in terms of the, the key issues, and I noted what you said about this is about looking forward, but perhaps if you just bear with me a little bit about looking back, just to say really that over the last 12 months, obviously been a very challenging time for everyone, for all services, but including financial challenges in there. And just in terms of the national context, um, there were seven capitalisation directives issued by the government last year um, to local authorities. That's where local authorities basically needed more money. Um, government allowed them to borrow to fund revenue shortfalls, which is, is usually something that local authorities can't do. But the government gave approval to seven local authorities to, to borrow to see them through uh, the, the 12-month period and hopefully longer. Um, there were three public interest reports issued by external auditors um, expressing concerns about the financial uh, affairs of, of individual local authorities and a one section 114 notice issued in a local authority and that's where the director of finance basically says he has concerns he or she has concerns about the um uh, the budget of that particular local authority and um, ask that to be formally noted and actions to be put in place. That doesn't sound like very many one section 114 notice, but it's probably only about a third or fourth in the history of local government. So it shows some of the challenges that there were around. Um, from Calderdale's perspective, so looking a bit more further forward, there is a chart within um, the presentation that shows SIPFA's Resilience Index. And it picked up Calderdale as one of perhaps not the most at risk authorities in terms of fin finances, but of concern. And that's mainly because of the, uh, the relatively low level of our reserves. Um, so in terms of our reserves levels, you know, we're towards the bottom of those 36 metropolitan districts in terms of the, the overall level and what they call the sustainability of reserves, which is if we continue to use our reserves at the level we have done over the last three years, they will very quickly run out. Um, to counter that, and one of the things that's also in the uh, resilience index from SIPFA is the fact that we have a very low level of debt. So that's, that's a, seen as a positive thing in terms of resilience because compared to the other metropolitan districts, we have both a low level of debt and a low proportion of our budget spent on servicing that debt. All that is based on 2019-20 data because that's nationally the, the best information that's available, the most up-to-date information. Um, members will probably be aware that the outturn report for Calderdale is going to Cabinet next Monday and looks at the financial position in, in the most recent financial year. 
Calderdale's reserves will be increasing from around 35 million to 53 million. So that's a positive step in terms of the council's sustainability. Um, the debt will also increase, but I don't think that will particularly impact upon our ranking in terms of the resilience index. Uh, but as I say, the outturn report will set that out in more detail. The next part of the, um, the presentation was really about looking forward. What are the risks in the current year and future year? And key amongst that was probably be the ongoing impact of, of COVID, both in terms of the, the budget pressures around adult social care in particular, and around the, the losses of income. And that can be losses of income in both services, so parking and sports are probably foremost in my mind on those, but also in terms of council tax and business rates, which you mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. um, government support is available um, on council tax and business rates for last year, but not for this year. On parking, sports, etc., cetera, um, the government compensation scheme is in place until the end of June. Um, so we'll be able to reclaim some money up to the end of June, but any losses after that will be picked up by the council. And we were given, as part of the budget, an allocation of £6 million in terms of additional costs. And again, that will have to stretch for the whole of the financial year, um, unless uh, there is further government support available, but there's no indication of that at this stage. So that's one of the key risks on top of delivering the existing savings targets and thinking about next year's budget where the medium term financial strategy at the moment subject to the Chancellor's spending review later this year suggests we might be looking at about another five million pounds worth of savings next year and potentially up to six million pound the year after. So those are some of the key risks. You talked about opportunities so try to bring those out as well and particularly devolution and in financial terms, the gain shared arrangements that that will bring to local authorities uh, and money that, that hopefully that will bring into Calderdale. There's obviously the economic recovery and the opportunities that the council will have to help drive the recovery within Calderdale. Um, and then there's the, the, the whole background, which is a subject in its own about social care and health integration and the opportunities and probably the risk that that will bring. Um, in terms of the, you, you mentioned in terms of the presentation about priorities. So the financial priorities are, are probably a, around that continued resilience and sustainability. If we can maintain the level of reserves, then that will allow us to be more resilient for some of those risks in terms of ongoing costs and budget pressures that I talked about. Um, Another priority will be making the most of those opportunities. So the things around gain share and the economic recovery, how can the council be best placed to make the best in, ter in financial terms and in terms of the best for our residents of those opportunities? And I suppose the final priority is about the medium term financial strategy, updating that and then starting to plan the budget process. I would hope that we'd start to look again at a three-year budget process, um, but that will be very much dependent upon whether we get a, a three-year spending review um, in the autumn, um, which will give us some, some more clarity, hopefully. So those are some of the priorities from a financial perspective. I think if you ask me about the priorities of the finance service, then it is probably around those and supporting the organisation in, in dealing with those, those issues at the same time as my service goes beyond accountancy, et cetera, um, some of my other teams will be looking at um, supporting the business, the council around transformation. So business intelligence, audit, the commercialization team and business support admin will all be helping support frontline service delivery and, and changing the way we do things over the next 12 months. And I'll uh, pause there, if that's okay, and perhaps mm. try and pick up some of the mm. points that you raised earlier and any other questions from members. So uh, thank you for taking us through that. As you say, quite rightly, we've had a chance to see that. Uh, Megan, did you have your hand up on? Uh, I did, yeah. As a substitute, I'm allowed to make 
uh, dad questions up. And probably everybody knows how. But I was pleased but concerned that the reserves had gone from 35 million to 52 million. What made up the difference? I don't think that's a silly question at all. It was very appropriate. <laughs> Now, so now is your Sue. Sue, in a minute. In terms of the reserves, um, if you look through the outturn report, it's broken down into a number of areas. We are able to carry forward some of the COVID funding, government funding, about six million pounds from last year. Some of the um, directorates uh, uh, are planning, or not planning, but are actually carrying forward reserves that they were planning to use last year. So in particular, adult social care um, was going to use all its remaining reserves, uh, but didn't have to do so because of um, uh, support it got from the CCG last year in terms of additional funding around uh, discharges from hospital, et cetera. Um, so it's a mixture of, of those directorate reserves that weren't used will be carried forward and, and will be valuable in the future and some of the COVID funding that we've carried forward and, and actions that were taken by the council to uh, deliver its existing savings plans, et cetera. Uh, all those combined together has is, is, is managed to at least reserve some or increase the amount of reserves up to a, a, a more, um, a better position uh, than previous years. Okay, thank you. Susan, you were wanted to get in as well, I think. Councillor Press. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just trying. It's not unmuting. Can you unmute me? You are unmuted. We can hear you. I could anyway. Now you've muted again. My question's also on the reserves. Um, just let me check I've got these figures right. Nigel, you said we know we will you would expect to have 53 million pounds worth of reserves, is that correct? Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. And it was previously 35? That's correct. So could I just ask a question? Um, it, I just wonder why we're not using some of that in, increase in reserve to mitigate um, some of the cuts um, that um, are, you know, are, are currently on the table, i.e. The, um, the five million pounds and the, and the six million pounds. Would it not be, um, would it not be a good thing to use some of that increased reserves to actually stop um, services being reduced? In, in terms of the um, reserves themselves, um, I can see how 53 million pounds might seem um, a lot in terms of the reserves, but actually um, a significant proportion of those are earmarked for specific purposes. So we have five million pounds, which we set aside as the minimum level of balances that the council must have. There's around seven million pounds of the insurance reserve, which I, I would recommend that the council doesn't use because that's set aside to meet future um, potential insurance liabilities. There's money set aside to fund the capital program that's already been agreed. So in terms of the amount of usable reserves that's in there, it, it actually comes down to, to, to quite small amounts um, in terms of supporting the, the amount that's available to support the budget. Um, obviously within that 53 million pounds, there's also the, the monies that was brought forward on COVID funding. And as I said before, one of the big risks facing the council this year is that money may well be and will be required, I, I imagine this year, because of the fact that the loss of income will continue during the course of this year. Additional costs will no doubt continue. We will need that funding in the current year. So whilst I say it, it looks like um, a relatively healthy position in terms of reserves, those are primarily earmarked for specific purposes rather than supporting the budget. Can we have I've a breakdown, got... Nigel? They could we, in that case, could we have a... Would it be possible at some point to have a detailed breakdown just so we understand that um, a bit more? Because on the surface, it does look like an awful lot of money. Mm. I, think, I think that would be useful, Susan, uh, for us to have. As you say, you look at 53 million as opposed to 25, 23 or whatever it was, uh, and you think, wow, we've got lots of money. 
uh, Nigel seems to have unfortunately uh, made us get less excited about that bigger figure, but it'd be useful to have the actual data. So please, yeah, that'll be good. I've got Stephen and Jacob. I think Jacob was first. Jacob, do you want to? Uh, yes, yeah, certainly. Ask a question. And yes, uh, yeah, hi, hi, Nigel, uh, Mr. Broadbent. Sure, I'll call you, I'll call you Nigel. Um, okay, Nigel, yes, yeah, so just a couple of picking up on something, um, you um mentioned you said that level of external debt in Coldale has, in, has increased due to prudential borrowing, but will still be low relative to other local authorities. But I just wanted to pick up on that because, according to the, the table, the uh, at the start of your document, it actually highlights that we were like 35th out of 36 metropolitan districts in the level of debt that we have. So it actually, I would understand that as meaning that it's not actually low relative to other local authorities. It's actually about as bad as it could be um, if, in compared to, to 36 other metropolitan districts. So, so I just wanted to ask how much is the debt increased by? Could you answer that? Yeah, just in terms of, of um, and so I should say, Nigel's fine, by the way. Thanks. Um, yeah, thanks. <laughs> in terms of a table, it's difficult to actually set that out, and perhaps I have um, I could have clarified that a, a bit. In terms of the thirty fifth out of thirty six, it's the lowest level, is what that's saying. Um, we could have put it right. the other way. It's this. It's the second lowest, if you like. Or it's this. So. Um, all oh, right. So the, it's so that's positive. Than, yeah, it's a positive. So it's, better than, it's better than the other thirty-five then. Effectively, yes. that's what. Yeah, that's what we're saying. Ah, that's very good. I wrote the wrong way around. So yeah. I'm pleased you clarified that. <laughs> yeah, that's good. But in terms of the increase, yeah. the increase went from um, 149 million to 161 million. Um, or important to say that all of the prudential borrowing is agreed, approved by council in advance of it being incurred. Uh, the vast majority of that, we're not looking back in detail, will be probably on the street lighting LED replacement uh, contract that was uh, agreed by council and also um, an element of the Northgate House scheme. Those would probably be the two biggest elements, but again, I can provide more information if that's helpful. But it's important to say that it is all agreed by council in advance of that debt actually being incurred. So it's not something that we get to year end and it's a surprise to members. It, it has to be approved in advance through the capital programme. Right, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks for that. And sorry, Thank you. Well, I've still got you. That certainly one of question. my questions when you look at it, because if you, if you see the it, low is good or high is good, it depends which way around you're looking at the figures, isn't it? It's the lies, damn lies and statistics. It was certainly an area that I was uh, considering. But Jacob, did you want to come back? Sorry, did I talk over you there? Sorry, no, no just on a separate separate point. Um, obviously, looking now to the future beyond COVID and to recovery, um, I was just interested in the financial opportunities. Um, uh, sorry, the, the, the priorities and growing income. It says housing plan. Just wondered if you could provide more details. Is, is that growing the the council's revenue? Um, so is that a positive thing? Um, okay, I just wanted to ask for, for more details on that, if that's possible. H how that will benefit the council the housing plan? It seems to suggest it might cost more money, but I just wanted a few more details on that. In, in financial terms, I'm seeing setting aside all the, the issues around housing, I'm seeing that as a positive in terms of the more housing there is in Calderdale, obviously it brings in council tax income. So when I think right. about the, the, the income that can come in for the council that it has some control over, because um, the main streams are government grants, which are obviously fixed, uh, business rates, which the council has some influence over and takes a share of, but then council tax income and fees and charges, fees and charges being uh, specific charges we have for services such as, again, parking, sports, etc. So one of the areas of income, big areas of income, £100 million pounds, um, of the revenue income to the council each year is council tax. So clearly both in terms of collection of the existing council tax income, but also growing that income 
that benefits the, the council in budgetary terms. So that's that, that's something that will clearly impact upon the council's budget in future years is the, the level of, of housing development that there is in the borough. Yeah, as part of the local plan. Yeah, understand. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Matthew. Stephen, you had your hand up. What question from you? Thank you, Chair. Um, I've got a couple of questions. Um, but first, I'd like to make a comment about the presentation that, that we see here on this first page. Um, and we shouldn't take it lightly that 35th under reserve sustainability is very bad, I think. And 35th on gross external debt, we're told, is very good. Whatever those respective figures are, it's misleading to have them in the same column and without a plus or minus in front of them, because you just, we've got to be very careful what we look at. And whilst you actually have mentioned lies, lies and statistics, I'm not impugning any lies whatsoever, no. but statistics are there to be enjoyed and to be useful. And that table is, is not very useful. And I also have to, first of all, before my main point, agree with Councillor Press's observation. A very good question. How come the reserves are more than we thought? I would contend, and not everybody would agree, that the real reserves are still at around about 6 million, just hovering above the 5 million limit that we agreed in council some time ago. Those reserves had run down from a very much higher number a few years ago. So the real reserves are 6 million. And so when we're told the 50 million, we're including, as Nigel said, things that we've got the money for now, but are all earmarked for other uses. So the very great danger in including those as, and, and even talking about them as reserves is if you start using some of those so-called reserves and then we have to spend the money that they're earmarked for, what we'll find is we've gone below the 5 million real reserves that we've set. So it's a very, very important difference there. So my main point was, given Vision 24, it, bearing that in mind, those top numbers, 35th, 33rd and so on, compared with 36 other boroughs, actually worry me a great deal. And I've mentioned at a number of council meetings, my concern about overall debt and debt repayment. And it's all about opinions. I'm concerned about that. Uh, when I've mentioned this and asked questions, I've been told I don't understand what I'm talking about and everything's okay. But the very fact that we're 35th in the rankings for reserve sustainability, it's a risk rating pointing well, well upwards, as is an, only one other in that table. But that reserve sustainability is a very great worry. And Councillor Press is quite right. That, that it's not 50 million, it's more like 6 million plus notionally 44 million pounds of cash that we've got earmarked for something else that if we use and at all and think of them as reserves at all, they'll come back to haunt us because we'll drop below the 5 million limit that we set, which is the real level of reserves. And the other point that I had, um, when we're told about being low relative to other authorities, I don't like non-specific financial statements. So I would say how low and by what measurement? Because the financial figures are based on sometimes complex calculations. So it's not good enough for me to see, but we'll still be low relative to other local authorities. Well, how low, how much, how do we calculate it? How can we be sure? Thank you, Chair. Nigel, would you like to respond to that? Yeah, um, hopefully I'll try and pick up on all those points. I'll try to make a note of them. Firstly, in terms of the presentation, then yes, it's something I can look at in terms of how it's presented in future. I've tried to make that clear in my presentation, but you've obviously got failed in that. I'm sorry. Um, in terms of the reserves position, yes, the low level of reserves from a financial risk point of view is is not good and 
a low level of debt from a financial point of view is is considered to be in terms of financial risk is is considered to be good. So I try and make that clearer in the tables in future. The table is produced by SIPFA and I'll, um, and the information is all available on our website. So I can either direct members to that website or actually produce some of the information that will show you uh, the specific figures for each of the metropolitan districts to show you exactly how much we are uh, uh, different from, from every other local authority. So uh, as I say, I can either do that by through the website or I should actually present uh, that information to, to members um, following the meeting or to further meeting, whichever they wish. Um, I think the point about differentiated between balances and reserves is, is, is a good point in terms of the general level of balances. So those are the, those are the, the funds that are set aside by the council for unforeseen circumstances and not for any specific purpose. And the minimum recommended value by and recommended by myself is has been five million for a number of years. Um, and the council has, has stayed above that five million pounds, um, certainly um, over the last, well, since I've worked here. Um, on top of that, there are reserves that are earmarked for specific purposes. And you're right that they're for specific purposes. So if the council chose to use those, then um, they would either have to stop doing whatever it was they were intended for, such as the capital programme, or would need to replace them at a later stage. So it is important to differentiate between balances and reserves, but SIPFA's resilience index is based on a consistent measure across all local authorities and users the measure of total reserves, including balances, excluding schools balances and excluding public health balances, because those are classed as being for a specific purpose that can't be used by the council or anything else. So it's a clear definition by SIPFA and they use that. And that's why it's presented in this way, because it's then consistent with all other local authorities. Uh, but as I say, I can provide lots more information about how we compare and measure against every other local authority. So it will be clear exactly how much difference there is rather than a, a ranking. That, <clears throat> thank you, Nigel. I mean, I understand respect your objective to put some clear, concise data down on, on these particular charts. Uh, but I understand also, uh, Councillor, Councillor Lee's concerns about our understanding and just going a very quick little aside, I'm chair of a local um, uh, governing body and when we have our financial statements on, because we have lots of people who aren't financial people, there are little annotated marks with item one, item two, item three, explaining what each of those are, doing a little subdivision. I don't know whether it's possible to have a little think about doing something like that for two reasons. One, to be a little bit more informative to those who are less au fait with the way the things work and two to save questions unnecessarily um, in, in this situation I mean, again not a criticism just a suggestion thrown in which seems to work quite well in a very small scale in, in a small governing body but thanks for raising that one Stephen um, Dan Southern Councillor Southern I've missed you I'm afraid but I've just been reminded so please Dan jump in and uh, let's have your comments you, sorry about missing you're on the end of my list <laughs> Uh, I think Councillor Metcalf weighed in as well. <laughs> it may have even been. Away. If you have started, I'll, I'll continue, <laughs> if you don't mind. All right, uh, thank you for the presentation, Nigel, and it's nice to see you. Um, and, and, and on reserves as well. Um, and I find, whilst I find the relative rankings um, useful, I think as with um, how you did with the balances, there's, a, there's an agreed figure that I think we all can understand and relate to. Uh, and, and I wonder whether there's, an opportunity for a uh, sort of reserve strategy um, that has a figure in terms of reserves that we think that we should be based at, which might fluctuate based on interest rate. Um, but at the moment, it, it's tricky to know because is it, a relative, is it a ranking that we should be relative on? Maybe there is a time when it is better to be trim as a council and spend your reserves, and sometimes there's going to be a time when it's better to, to stock them up. And sometimes that might mean that we. Um, aren't necessarily working relative to, to other councils. Um, so I wonder if you, you know, it talks about um, increasing or streamlining, um, I can't remember the word, 
uh, stabilizing the reserves. So I just wonder if you have an idea of where that might be, of where you would find the reserves to be in a stable position. I struggled a bit with hearing that. Nigel, did you get it? I, I think I, I got a gist of it, if that's okay, Chair, and I'll, I'll try yeah. and answer it. I, I, I don't think I could probably say here's a specific figure that we should aim for, as we do with balances, but it's actually, it's, it's a good question in terms of the reserves, are, as I say, earmarked for specific purposes and, and should only be used in a kind of short-term emergencies for other purposes. Uh, but it's something that I know is an earlier question about a kind of breakdown of the uh, reserves, which um, we do as part of the statement of accounts that go to audit committee each year. And perhaps we could um, we could circulate that information to show what they are earmarked for. So um, and it will give some indication then of, of the kind of level of flexibility within that. But it's something that um, I'm, I'm quite happy if it's a, a subject of interest to, to uh, to the scrutiny board uh, to come back with at some stage in terms of something specifically either about resilience or reserves, whichever. But I can I can certainly circulate some information in the first place. The only thing I've probably been clear on, hopefully, in the past has been that our level of reserves is is too low and that we should try to increase them wherever possible to um, to give the, the council more resilience, but I, I say without necessarily saying increasing them to a specific level, but it's certainly something I can provide some more information on. Thank you, Nigel. Uh, Dan, does that did that cover your question? I'm assuming yes. Um, I've got uh, uh, Councillor Metcalf and then Councillor Dacre. I think wants to come in as well. Bob, do you want to hit, go off first? Uh, yes, uh, I think some of it's been said because I was just going to comment on the discussion about reserves. My concern on uh, on on reserves is is when is when figures are, are taken out of context and without any you know without any meaning uh, of the implications of them. I'm not not meaning by Nigel and within the council. I'm meaning when these figures can sometimes be taken outside the council, and 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 you as all well, we have quite substantial sums we can help and in, in 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 working through our uh, budget challenges each year um, so it is a concern I don't know um, I don't know whether it's just the word reserves but uh, it, it just it always seems to bring forward discussions about uh, uh, about how, how, the, how these are and how they're used and I I think Nigel's already mentioned this but I cannot relate, uh, recollect any time uh, that the council has gone below its recommended uh, uh, five million, as it has been for some time now, uh, amount that it might have been other figures in years gone by. But I can't ever remember as as being in any danger of, of of not knowing that we were going to uh, broach on that on that limit that we should not go under. Uh, that that's there for by audit for a proper purpose to face any real emergencies that may crop up from year to year. And I don't think we've ever had to drop below that figure. Um, and so I can't see a danger of that happening. I think it might have been suggested there may be. But I think with the processes we have uh, and the council, as, as, we, as we move forward uh, uh, with the cabinet, that, that I, I think that, that, that's not a danger. We certainly won't be, able, won't be doing that. I just wanted to, just, just one follow up, further comment about the updating of the medium term financial strategy. Uh, Nigel's mentioned this, but following the Chancellor's spending review, is it November again, uh, normally around November time? Um, and then we're working on the budget process. It would be great if we if we could get a, a spending review longer than one year. And I'm not just sure if Nigel's heard anything on the great vine, probably not in this early stage, just if, if that's going to be the case. That now, it, we must move off, I hope, these, these one year um, spending reviews. I'm hoping it is going to be three years and then we can plan properly because trying to plan a budget process for three years, we know how difficult that's been in recent years to do. And so let's hope we can get back to what we did in Calderdale as a council and, and plan properly the three-year budgets. And it, it's much more sensible. You can get longer running times for planning uh, and, and we have to still consider planning for savings for cuts, even though austerity I thought had gone away uh, certainly hasn't for local councils, 
So we're still having to plan for these cuts and further savings in future years. And But we need a proper uh, spending review uh, to enable us to plan sensibly for that over a long, longer period of time. Thanks, Bob. Any, any response to that, uh, Nigel? Um, just wanted to say that um, I, I agree that it would be useful to have a, a three-year spending review so that we can return to um, hopefully a, a three-year budget process which helps planning ahead for any future savings. Uh, but I, I don't know at this stage whether it will be um, the, the Chancellor will be doing a three-year um, spending review or a one-year one. Um, I, I don't know. And in terms of the timing of that, um, again, we, we haven't been notified unless members know better than I do um, when it will be. Um, I would normally expect somewhere between October and November, but um, uh, clearly we the earlier the better from um, from an officer perspective in terms of trying to draw together the medium term financial strategy. Thank you. Um, Councillor Dacre, Sylvia, did you want to come in? I think I picked up a what? note accordingly. Yeah, well, I noticed that um, Councillor Porritt had wanted to come in, so would, I think it would be better if she came first. Okay, yeah, I fine. Put, I, put my, I put my hand up late, Ashley, so uh, sorry I'm for that. Sorry. Um, yeah, carry so on. Just, just occurred to me on, on a very slightly different tack going away from the reserves. Um, I know it's early days in terms of the devolution and the mayoral authority, but obviously there is um, gain share money attached to that. And I wondered if you had any more information about um, potentially when or how we access our part of that and what form that might take, whether that needs to be project based or sort of how that functions really in terms of how that in intersects with the local authorities. Thanks. Um, I think it's another one where I say it's, um, it's probably early days to, to be able to judge that. I mean, we know roughly what um, the, the kind of gain share arrangements will be, but in terms of um, the approach that will be taken and, and projects that will be brought forward, um, I think it, it is too early at this stage. Um, clearly, from our point of view, I put it down there as an opportunity because um, yeah, from Calderdale's point of view, then we'll be looking to, however that gain share is distributed, we'll be looking to try and make sure that Calderdale gets um, um, at least a fair share of that, 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 the one that is available in whatever form it takes. Mm. Okay, thanks. Thanks for raising that. Um, Sylvia, did you want to come in or? Okay, thank you, Chair. Yes, just a few things I wanted to say, really. Um, I think I, I was just looking at business grants when Nigel was talking, so I'm not too sure if he said this, but you asked the question at the very beginning, Chair, about whether the government had covered all of our costs. And the very basic answer is no, because they have left us to find 25% of our losses. Um, so that would be anything from parking losses to council tax and business rate losses. So whilst we have indeed received money from the government, and there is some of that um, that will help us this year as well, at some stage, somehow, all local authorities have to find that 25%. Um, and just because we've been able to carry over the council tax and business rate um, losses um, into the next year doesn't mean that we haven't got to find it at some stage. Um, there were other, um, if I could just go through some of the other questions that were mentioned. Um, in relation to business grants, um, if my own reading of the figures is right in the last update that we got, I wouldn't at all want to suggest that there haven't been problems for some individuals and that some of those problems have gone on for a long time. And that's been very, very difficult for those people because clearly people are desperate for the money. Um, but if I read the figures right, we have paid out over 11,000 claims and we've paid out over £28 million in grants. So a lot of people have had their money. Um, and of course, that doesn't make it any better for those few who haven't, I appreciate that. Um, all I would ask um, people to bear in mind is that every time a new grant has come out, there are different criteria, there are more strict criteria. They have to be um, 
looked at by the council. They have to be um, dealt with in terms of the IT for the applications. All of that has to be developed and does take time. And we have to remember that this is central government money that is given to us. Um, it's taxpayers' money. And we have to pay that out with due respect to ensure that there aren't losses so that we don't um, pay fraudulent claims and we don't make payments in error, either through our error or the error of people who misunderstand what they should be applying for. And all of that, if you're going to do it properly, does take time. Um, and of course, at the same time as doing all of this, the officers who are processing these claims have been trying to do their own jobs on top of it all. Um, so I would ask for some understanding of the difficulties that all councils have experienced in trying to deal with these, um, these business grants that they've been paying out on behalf of the government. And I would say that, yes, I, like every councillor, I imagine, have been contacted, but have been contacted by people who've had difficulties. And I am pleased to say that in most cases, those difficulties have been resolved after they've been taken up. Although, again, that doesn't help those people for whom there are still issues. Um, in terms of the reserve breakdowns, I think, if I'm right, Nigel, those figures will be set out in the council report, the, the outturn report that's going before cabinet next week. They get that gives a bit more detail about where the reserves are made up from in the different directorates. Um, uh, that, that, oh, do you want me to answer that now? Well, if, yeah, yeah. If, if, am I right? <laughs> Yes, there's more detail in the outturn report that we go into Cabinet on Monday. There's even more detail than that goes in the Statement of Accounts, uh, which goes to Audit Committee. Um, it goes into details about each reserve and what its intended use is and how much is in there and how much is changed from previous years and so on. So um, the Cabinet is very much a summarised version, but the Statement of Accounts, which is the hundred and odd page documents that is considered by audit committee each year will include the, the, the detail of every reserve that the council has. Yeah, thanks. Um, in terms of the table that Nigel produced, I, I do understand um, that it, it is a bit confusing when you look at it, but I would note that on the right hand side of it, there are green, yellow and red symbols, and they do give a clue as to whether it's good or bad. So all um, but I, I, I accept that it could perhaps be clearer to people who are not used to it. Um, and Councillor Cook, you asked about housing. And I would say, in addition to what Nigel said, the simple fact is that the more houses there are in Calderdale, the more council tax is paid. And that's the more income for the council to spend because we're increasingly expected by central government to rely on the taxes we ourselves raise. It's an increasing proportion of what we can spend. Um, but in addition to that, every new resident who comes into Calderdale is, of course, going to spend money in Calderdale. The more money that circulates in, the, in our economy, the better it is. They'll be starting up new businesses, which, again, can provide jobs to people. And that, again, increases prosperity. And, of course, what we'll also be hoping to do is work with uh, developers and builders to try to ensure that the, at least a proportion of the jobs in the construction of the houses do go to local people. So again, that should be a benefit to the economy to keep that money circulating in our own economy instead of going elsewhere. So I hope that there's more to it than just the, the council tax in terms of housing. Um, and I think Nigel's probably explained the difference between the the unallocated reserves and the other, other reserves, if you like, and so that there isn't a danger, and I hope he's reassured you that there isn't a danger of spending the five million by mistake because it, it's it's just not the same um, set of reserves. And just finally, um, in terms of the three-year settlement, nobody knows yet. All I can say is that the Local Government Association, which of course represents authorities of all um, political complexions, has been and continues to lobby very hard for the certainty that a three-year settlement uh, would give all councils to enable them to plan mm -hmm. and have some certainty for longer than a, a year, as has been the case for the last few years. And I just hope that that cross-party lobbying 
does have some effect this year. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Stephen, you were uh, raising your hand earlier, I think. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a couple of, uh, of things. Um, first of all, about um, Councillor Metcalfe's opinion. That, that I respect everybody's opinions, um, but the figures defy Bob's opinions about uh, the reserves um, because 34 districts are better than we are. So, you know, whatever. whatever. Right. My point I about. I don't think I made such a comment about that. I don't think I've commented on that at all. I, I wrote it down. You're mixing you up, mixing you up what never, you, well, let, I didn't interrupt you. Let me just finish, please. I'll let you um, come back on it if you wish. So, Sorry, ne ne next, with respect to the figures, for this scrutiny panel, particularly, it's absolutely essential that these figures are as accurate and unambiguous as we can possibly have them. That's what we're here for. We have a common objective here, which is not to showboat our respective policies, but to robustly scrutinise things that we see. So the accuracy of the figures is very, very important. And I would implore um, this board to insist that, that the figures are very, very accurate here, not broad brush strokes. And finally, just, just and I could be wrong, I, you know, wrong plenty of the time, but I just want to give you an example of how these figures can seriously take us into trouble. One of those resilience index uh, headings is level of reserves as a proportion of budget. Yeah? So, you know, everybody understands what that means. And we, it's said that it's 22%, a fifth. Now, if our budget's 250 million, say, and we use the upper figure that we've been given as reserves of 50 million, well, that's 22% roundabout. But if you use the figure that Councillor Press and me and a number of other people believe our, our actual reserves are around 5 million, that becomes 2.2%. And the difference is a, is a factor of 10 times. So if you've only got 2.2% of reserves to cover your budget, it's an extraordinarily low figure. Now, I might be right. I might be wrong in being concerned about that, but it's important that everybody should understand where those concerns come from. Um, it's not just a matter of saying it's 50 million or 5 million, but we, you know, we, we won't spend these because they're, they're, even though they're earmarked for something else. Those are critical figures that are used to determine even more critical figures. That's it, that of the proportion of reserves to budget. So I just wanted to clarify that. And we all need to understand this going forward, or we'll have troubles every time that we talk financial items at this board. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, can I just clarify, Chair? I didn't ask a question about the five million. I wanted I I asked for it to be explained about the 53 million, and Nigel has explained that. Yeah. Uh, I hope there wasn't any confusion caused by my question, but it was actually the the fact that £53 million pound looked like an awful lot of money. So Nigel has now explained there are lots of things earmarked in that amount. I, I understand that, Susan. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Bob, okay. did you want to come back uh, on your point earlier? Well, I was, I was, I was discussing the £5 million, um, and, and the suggestion that, that, that we, we might somehow sleepwalk into spending that unaware, which, of course, we won't. That's been well clarified. OK, that's fine. Um, Councillor Cook, did you want to come in on this one? Hi, yeah, sorry, I just wanted to, yeah, I just wanted to, uh, to come back on something uh, Councillor Dacre uh, mentioned in, in her comments, uh, particularly with respect to my question about the, the housing plan, how that's going to be used to increase council tax revenues. But I would like to make the point that people do move out of the, the area as well. So uh, I think if, if it's the, the council's idea to increase revenue by building more houses i think that's not going to work i think they need to look at other areas where they can bring revenue in and i think not just by thinking we'll build lots of houses and we'll get more council tax that way so i think 
people move out, people move in, and I think on balance, probably that's not going to be a very good way to increase the, the levels of council tax. Okay, Nigel, did you want to come back on any of those specific points raised by uh, board members? Um, perhaps just go back to the reserves. I know there's been quite a bit of discussion about that and hopefully I've tried to explain the differences between what we call general balances, which are the amounts that are available for un to cover unforeseen circumstances. And there's a minimum level of five million pounds, which is agreed with council and the reserves which are earmarked for specific purposes. Um, so as I say, I am quite happy to kind of circulate information about that. The, going back to the point uh, that Councillor Lee raised about the, the information within the presentation and SIPFA's resilience index. The resilience index produced by SIPFA uses total reserves. Um, I, I wouldn't be able to actually compare our general balances figures against every other local authority without access to that information, but it's at least done on a consistent basis. Um, I take the point about separating out the two, but SIPFA uses total reserves as, as their measure within the resilience index, and that's why we include the figure of 35 million for last year and 53 million for this year. So it's not an attempt to kind of demonstrate, to show it in a different way. It's an attempt to, to at least be consistent with all other local authorities who will set their balances at different levels relative to their, their net budget. Okay, thanks, Nigel. I think uh, one, I think there's one last question in this, uh, this context. Dan, would you, uh, Councillor Sutherland, did you want to come back on this? Absolutely, Make a point. I was just picking up on the conversation around housing and income growth. And one thing that hadn't, well, particularly over the past decade, it's been the government's policy to incentivise financially councils in the development of housing through the new homes bonus. Um, and I wonder if Nigel might give us an update on what the future of the new homes bonus is, or if there's any other um, sort of housing incentive schemes that are available to us. I didn't get a lot of that, I'm afraid to say. Nigel, did you pick up on that? I have picked up the points about new homes bonus, and um, I don't think my presentation was attempted to say that the, the council is, in a t is, is trying to drive income in this way. All I'm pointing out is that one of the key factors in terms of income available to the council is council tax. Um, as in a lot of the other areas, such as government grant are fixed and, and council tax and business rates. Uh, these <clears throat> charges are obviously the variable element of it. So um, it is an attempt to show um, kind of the, the importance of that to the council's overall budget and, um, and its ability to, to spend <clears throat> varying degrees. <clears throat> okay, thank you. I think we've probably given uh, Nigel and his subjects quite a serious grilling on this. Uh, and I think we need uh, perhaps uh, to take on board the, the clarity of the information, if, if any efforts can be made in that sort of area in particular. One final point that, that I've got, there's, there's a reference on the final slide about uh, commencing the budget process, hopefully based on a three-year basis. Um, I know that last year we sort of involved some of the other scrutiny committees, and this is me, I suppose, putting a bit of a marker down. I think we should extend that, and the other scrutiny committees like Adder Health and uh, CYP and so on should get an opportunity to look at things in, a, in a, a, an effective way with enough time to do so, which then perhaps feeds into our particular scrutiny committee. Having been on these other committees myself, I think it's important that those scrutiny committees get an opportunity to uh, look at that data and feedback and put it back through perhaps ourselves, which in turn will then go to, uh, to cabinet. But I'd like to think that other scrutiny groups could get the opportunity to make a, a positive input into that would be my final comment. Okay, thank you, Nigel. Me again. Me. Yep. Sorry, somebody's trying to get in. Me. Mingan. Okay. Mingan, sorry. Yes, you're yeah. on my other. <laughs> Thank you. I just, I mean, uh, I'm not overly sure. I mean, I'm sure you think that's right. But I mean, I've been on this council forever now. And all scrutiny panels, once we went to scrutiny panels, were uh, discussed and looked at. Um, the budget and all that sort of thing. 
and it's still <laughs> happening. I thought that when we changed which ones we had to have a strategy, etc., it was this uh, board panel, whatever, that would look at all the figures, but it didn't work out there because, you know, you've been on others as well. You want to know what's happening in your own bit of um, the territory, etc. And, you know, you can't do a lot about budgets until you know how much you've got, which is a bit of a devil, but I finished. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, I shall certainly be raising the issue at the chairs and deputy chairs uh, scrutiny meeting uh, and talk and see if we get reactions from other scrutiny chairs on that subject. Um, let's move on to item number six. Um, and the first in those is uh, Ian has managed to get to us in the time of this current uh, subject. So service priorities for the year ahead, legal and democratic services. Ian Hughes, would you like to do your session please thank you chair um and thanks uh, for putting this back if you did my apologies there was a lot of traffic and one or two accidents unfortunately on this evening's roads well, um, thank you um priorities for legal and democratic services i'll start with with legal services and i suppose there isn't one overriding priority that we have within legal but it's a continuation of the need to provide a comprehensive service across the council. Uh, we're one of the departments within the council that probably touches all areas of it in the advice and support uh, that we provide. And uh, there's a great deal of that that has been required uh, over the last uh, 15, 16 months or so, different from the normal run of the mill work where there's been a need to respond uh, very uh, quickly and, and pragmatically sometimes to the need to have contracts in place very, very quickly and to provide uh, different solutions to some of the, the demands that have been made upon uh, other areas of, of the council. And I'm pleased to say that the uh, reports I've had back from uh, heads of service uh, have been complementary of the, uh, the support that they've had from uh, the different lawyers that work across uh, contracts and and the other teams within within legal. So there's a continuation of that certainly that uh, I'd I'd uh, very much expect to see. Um, in addition, uh, I know that there's going to be um, a greater emphasis uh, on uh, continued work around the West Yorkshire uh, Transport Fund and the infrastructure projects that uh, continue to be uh, developed. Uh, with West Yorkshire Combined Authority and, and delivered by, uh, by Calderdale Council. And there's a great deal of uh, contractual work that's required uh, to support that. Uh, and also some um, compulsory purchase uh, work that's required to uh, assemble the, the land that's required uh, in, in connection with uh, a lot of the, the infrastructure works that, that will be required. So there's a great deal that will be happening uh, over the next uh, two, three, four, maybe five years around uh, the delivery of those schemes and, and the legal support that, that sits with it. Um, also within legal and democratic services is the need for there to be um, continued support around information governance. And um, that continues to be an issue that needs to uh, ensure the protection of the the very valuable data that we have as an authority, the personal data that we carry. And again, through the pandemic, there's been a need for there to be innovative approaches to the use of data uh, that ordinarily would be, be held within some partner organizations and, and not shared uh, with others. But at times like this, the need to understand uh, quite how we reach the, the communities that we need to, those people who uh, have specifically needed to be supported, vulnerable people particularly. That's been essential that we've been uh, looking at the way in which the data that we, sh we hold as a council can be used uh, to help our partner organisations and, and, and utilise the data that they hold uh, married with ours to make uh, the uh, information that we provide and how we provide it uh, so much better. Uh, democratic services, um, members will be aware from communications that have gone out recently that 
we are looking to, well, we have switched to a uh, system known as ModGov, which is an app-based system for the delivery of information that is essential to you um, and to the, the residents of the borough uh, around the decisions that are, are taken uh, within the cabinet and committee system that we have within Calderdale. And uh, that is a system that uh, we are going to be looking to, uh, to move across to uh, over the, the next few months or so. Um, it should be building upon what members have already embraced by way of uh, moving towards a digital system to have uh, agendas uh, and, and papers provided uh, on electronic devices. The ModGov system hopes to uh, make that a, a, a more intuitive process. It's a more tailored process so that you as members can uh, register on the system and then indicate uh, which committees, which, which, which items you are uh, interested in. And those will be provided to you automatically through, uh, through the, the app that is available on, on whichever device that you have chosen to, uh, to receive it. Um, we hope that that is something that uh, operates in a, a seamless way. We recognize getting used to systems is not always as straightforward as we would hope, uh, but there is support from our IT department and from the ModGov uh, company itself and from Democratic Services to, to assist with that. And that is a, an important uh, transition that, that we hope to make. I mean, you've all demonstrated practically overnight how how quickly uh, you all became used to uh, to operating on a, a Zoom or, or, or Teams-based system. Uh, and that um, demonstrates that, uh, that where there is a, a need to do that, then, then we can all respond positively. So similarly, we hope the ModGov system is one that provides us with the, uh, the functionality to, uh, to allow, uh, again, a, a better use of, uh, of digital devices to ensure that we are uh, embracing that as, as much as we possibly can. There's a lot goes on behind the scenes, as you can imagine, uh, to ensure that that, uh, that system will operate properly. Officers too will have to become used to the way in which they um, upload uh, the reports that, that are produced for the various um, committees and boards uh, that we service. Um, but again, that would be something that would be worked through over the next few months. Uh, and I, I would hope that that would be a a system that uh, that delivers uh, the efficiency that uh, we expect it to. Um, apart from that, um, elections obviously is another uh, area within legal and democratic services. Uh, we've been through uh, an unprecedented uh, election process uh, over the last um, two months, three months or so. Um, I would hope that we wouldn't have to go through uh, that process again, although we did learn some some very valuable lessons from the way in which that was conducted um, and would hope that we would embrace some of the, um, the positive elements that came out of it uh, for future elections, even if they don't have to be held in a, a COVID secure way. Uh, I think there were uh, areas that, that worked really well um, and we would look to, to encourage uh, use of those in, in, in future election processes. Um, Chair, I think that's probably a summary of, of the areas that, um, that I'm responsible for and the, the overall priorities that, um, that I, I will be looking for. Uh, it's important to remember, obviously, that the, the, the lawyers within the authority are responsible for ensuring that they report through to me uh, areas of concern across the, across the council where um, we need to ensure that the council is at all times operating lawfully and within the uh, statutory um, processes that govern what we do and that is something I'm pleased to say happens uh, really well and there are very few areas where uh, I need to to step in with a, a monitoring officer um, perspective uh, and resolve any issues that, that are presented to me so uh, we, we don't get complacent about that but um, I'm pleased to say that it's an area that uh, that, that, that goes on behind the scenes and, and members very rarely get to know about issues because they are they are resolved if, if they arise at all. Happy to take any uh, any questions on those areas, Chair. Thank you, Ian. Um, so members, uh, any comments, uh, clarifications, questions uh, of Ian on his oral report? Mm -hmm. um, 
Megan, I think you had your hand up at one point. Uh, yeah, I'm waving madly. We've got to find a way to see you. Waving madly, surely. <laughs> Vigorously, then. Um, yeah. Question for Ian, if you don't mind. This isn't a criticism of anyone. I think the staff in election did a brilliant job, but then I always think they've done a brilliant job. But it was hard for them to do a brilliant job this time. But has do we know what caused the problem with the postal votes? I know it wasn't down at our office, but all over the place because. It were getting pretty dire bad time. Last few people got their votes, so or voting slip. And um, well, is it a system we use outside that did it, or was it just one of those things? Councillor, well, thank you for the comments about the uh, the service that the elections team provides. I think, uh, as you've rightly acknowledged, um, they do a remarkable job to ensure that the. Uh, a very difficult and complex process operates um, for the benefits of, of, of the residents and, and safely this time and, and for members too. Um, we use Royal Mail for the delivery of um, the postal votes and the, the system that was in place meant that there were some errors that were undertaken and made by the Royal Mail delivery system, uh, partly because of the pressure that it's under uh, for sending out um, uh, lateral flow test kits, for example, uh, it was a very busy period that uh, that they were dealing with um, that service, and unfortunately there was um, a, uh, a lack of service uh, for some of the delivery of, of those postal votes. Uh, we responded to that and reacted to that by ensuring that, uh, if at all possible, uh, we sent out a replacement again in the post, or if not, uh, we did uh, resort to, to delivering uh, by car. Uh, some postal vote packs that uh, needed to be delivered uh, within the timescales that would allow them to be uh, dealt with and, 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 re and, and returned. So it's unfortunately it happened, um, but as I said, it was one of those things that's outside of our control, um, but those areas that were within our control, the, the, the rectification that was required, uh, I think we responded to as, as well as we could. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anybody else? On uh, questions, um, don't think I have anybody. Oh, sorry, Bob. Bob, Bob, Bob. Yes, yes. Well done. We did indicate. Yeah, thank you. Okay. <laughs> uh, just, just two, just two comments. Uh, we we did discuss in the uh, the elections following it, when we were discussing the minutes uh, earlier this evening, and whether we because of the as you unprecedented situation this year. We just wonder if there's anything that will be reported back in due course um, about, about, I think you mentioned the certain learning, ex, learning aspects and other aspects of that. So I don't know whether it will come back to here, to this board or, or governance, but uh, I just wondered if that was going to happen at some stage in the next few months. And secondly, just on the MOG go, we're having to, <laughs> we're having to learn to use, use something else now. And these may be IT queries, but um, just when we've had the information this week uh, on, on this and, 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 and passwords, et cetera, to, to download the app. I certainly have had a problem trying to download the app, which I've passed on already. Uh, but the question really is that uh, we're asked to choose which device which could, we, we want it to have it downloaded onto, uh, either laptop or iPad or phone. And it concerns me because, of course, if it's reports and things like that, we need them on more than certainly working virtual I think we need them on more than one app I'm using my my laptop now on zoom but I'm also looking at any reports uh, during the meeting on my iPad so mm. just a concern can we only you are we only going to be able to use this across just one device and not across the devices we already you use to uh, obtain reports etc Jim, my understanding is that the app can be used across several devices, but I will double check that uh, and, and confirm to all members. But I'm, I'm fairly confident that because it's an app based system, uh, once you've registered and set it up, um, you can download the app to whatever device that, uh, that you wish to use it on, which can be multiple devices. But I'll, I will double check that for you. Just that we're, we're asked to choose in the email we got which device we wanted to use. 
maybe just for setup purposes for the for the setup right. of the username right. and password but I'll 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 I'll, I'll clarify that uh, councillor and come back to you on that because it is important I think that I know that many members and, and I use multiple devices myself to ensure that I can I can yeah. see uh, as much as I can so I, I will double check that in fact I'm probably getting a text from I'm, I'm being told that what I've just said is correct so there you go that's that's <laughs> impressive democratic services service service for you <laughs> okay um, done. Oh, not bad <laughs> it's also quite sad that one of my colleagues is actually listening into this <laughs> um the second question chair yes we normally bring a report through to governance and business committee uh on the the election process uh later in the year but there's no reason i don't think why that can't be shared with uh with with, with the scrutiny board thank you Ian. uh dan i think uh, you were trying to attract my attention at some point as well and i was Thank you, yeah. Chair. And further to Bob's comment, comments, I do agree. I'm using my personal devices after the iPad failed, so I hope you can hear me better now. I can hear you a lot better. Yeah. Um, <laughs> my question actually related, Ian, to the uh, people tuning into meetings like, like your colleague has, um, and I wasn't sure whether this was the re relevant scrutiny panel, but um, whether we've assessed uh, about how the past year um, and the opening up uh, of, of our processes in many ways by moving to online, um, and the probably increased opportunity or time for people maybe to tune into council meetings. Has that had an effect? Have we seen an increase in people tuning into our meetings over the past year? Um, is there any learning we can take from the past year in terms of um, increasing that? Because we're never going to pack the council chamber or the town hall, probably not realistic or something we want to do. Realistically, a lot more people can tune in at home, perhaps get the bits they want to get out of our meetings and tune back out again in between making the tea. So yes. I just wondered what, what, what we learned from that and how can we how can we make the most of it going forward? It, it's a very fair point, Councillor, because certainly from uh, looking uh, at the number of, of views of the meetings that have taken place, it's it's vastly superior to, to those people who would have otherwise attended uh, in person in, in any of the meetings that we hold, either um, a full council meeting or, or cabinet meeting. So we've certainly seen an increase in the ability for people to um, to witness the democratic process. I think perhaps the the one downside of that is is participation in it, because obviously the um, the one function that, that that isn't available to people who are uh, watching this uh, on YouTube is the ability to participate uh, in the meeting, and um, mm -hmm. arguably that isn't. Um, a, a a reduction in, in in what was offered to them because there was no right necessarily for participation to take place in physical meetings that members of the public would would attend outside of the uh, the, the the cabinet question time uh, submission of, of questions to, to, to council or participation in a scrutiny meeting if if, if it was relevant and they'd been invited uh, to do so or, or felt that they they had a, a contribution to make. So I think there is a, a need to, to understand quite how we, we build upon that um, for, for the democratic process and for members of the public who have clearly shown an interest in, in, in watching what goes on um, from the democratic uh, systems that we have. Um, we need to understand because of the unfortunate um, requirement that we return to physical meetings for decision-making meetings and the difficulties that that will present certainly in the interim period between now and the possible ending of restrictions in June or if it's a later date whenever that does end. Um, how we ensure that those people who, who wish to participate are able to do so because the uh, outcome of the, the Hertfordshire court case uh, is very, very clear in saying that anybody who wishes to participate in a meeting as a member of the public uh, or as a, a, a member of the opposition uh, needs to be physically in, in the meeting if it's a decision-making meeting that is being held physically. So there are um, practical issues that we're putting in place. So for example, for next Monday's cabinet meeting, um, members of cabinet, uh, myself, uh, Robin, 
and um, Kirsty, who will be taking the minutes, will be physically in the council chamber. The meeting will be live streamed uh, both on YouTube and to uh, room B in the town hall. So members of the public who, who wish to uh, attend uh, can do so. And if there's anybody else who wishes to, to ensure that they understand what is being discussed in the meeting and then wants to participate in it, can then be brought up to the uh, council chamber to do that. Now, that might unfortunately be a little bit clunky, um, mm -hmm. but it's a way of ensuring that uh, we remain uh, safe at the moment as far as the, the need for social distancing is concerned, uh, but we also offer uh, a facility that, that will have to be um, controlled by way of numbers. We can't have vast numbers of the public turning up to the to the to, to, to participate by sitting in room b um, and similarly obviously we have to have make make sure that we have uh, opposition members and other members who may wish to attend uh, unfortunately limited in numbers to allow them to uh, be in room b and come up to the chamber if they wish to to make a comment now that's going to be as you can imagine, perhaps a lengthier meeting than otherwise would be the case, but it does ensure that, that we comply with the regulations as they are at the moment uh, and, and allow uh, the meeting to take place in the way that it has to. So we are looking at all of this. There's, there's talk of, of, um, of, of hybrid systems where we have computer sc uh, sorry, television screens to allow participation by video from, from others who wish to remain at home. That can only happen with with non-decision making uh, meetings that we hold. So scrutiny, for example, or um, licensing because of the particular issues presented by the Licensing Act, which is allows certain licensing functions to be dealt with uh, outside of the Local Government Act, which requires um, meetings to take place in a physical location. So we are looking at all of that. Um, I'm anxious that we don't incur a great deal of cost and spend in, in, in fitting out our meeting rooms with, with huge TV screens that, that, that might not be utilised as much as, as perhaps we, we think they, they will be. Um, and that's why we're looking to use that system next Monday for Cabinet and for uh, future meetings that, that will take place between now and the 21st of June in, in the Town Hall. Thank you, Ian. It's interesting. Um, I've got uh, Jacob and Megan who have indicated. I think, Jacob, you were first. Do you want to fire away, please? Yes, yeah, certainly. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Ian. Um, not sure if this is the right uh, forum to ask this, but I know you're head of, head of legal. So, uh, and I'm interested in um, whether you mentioned it's your responsibility to make sure the council acts uh, legally, compliantly, and doesn't breach any uh, legislative uh, obligations that it has. But I wanted to ask, is the council currently being sued by anyone involved in any legal action where, where or, or, or been found in the past 12 months to have not complied with its legal obligations? Or if you're not permitted to say that, where can we as members get that information? Why would you want it? Um, members will be aware that there's a, a uh, judicial review claim that is current, um, which seeks to um, quash a decision that was taken by Cabinet um, in connection with the granting of a small waste incinerator plant. Um, that has, is an issue that is currently um, submitted to the court. Um, it's an application that's been made uh, by an individual on behalf of a, uh, a group that's um, interested in uh, that particular area. Um, and the council has uh, responded to that, uh, made its case, submitted its case, and it's now to be considered by, uh, by a judge who will decide whether there is a requirement for a, a full hearing um, in connection um, with that matter. And if, if so, um, that would be, then be determined uh, probably towards the end of, of this year, if not early next. Um, Apart from that, um, yes, of course, we, we are um, in proceedings um, regularly as far as uh, personal injury claims are concerned. Uh, those are dealt with through our insurance section and, and there's no council in the country that isn't um, being sued on a, a regular basis um, by uh, people who, who, who allege that they've, they've, they've incurred personal injury because of our failure to maintain 
uh, our road or, or, or path network or, or other areas of, of land owned by the council. Uh, I, I, I've no idea what the numbers are for that at the moment, I'm afraid. Um, apart from that, there's no significant uh, litigation uh, that we're involved in. Um, we have, again, um, regularly involved in uh, employment tribunal matters where um, we are, um, again, um, indications of, of the council not acting uh, in the way that it should in, in dealing with uh, in people's employment rights. But again, numbers are, are, are not, not, not particularly high in that regard, um, but we are involved in, in, in proceedings before an employment tribunal uh, throughout the course of the year. Um, there's no other um, significant litigation that, that, that I'm aware of, uh, which would cause me concern to be outside of what I would expect to be uh, the normal sort of uh, um, events that, that we would be involved in. Thank you, Ian. Um, Megan, you were next up, I think. You need you're to unmute. Councillor, you're on mute. There, come on. Sorry, folks. Um, you thank you. Yeah, it's it's quite a quickie, is this? But um, I want you all to know that I've decided I'm going to take council court position. So, if somebody buys me a hat, I will be all right. But going back to the mod go and IT, I'm really sorry, Stephen, but you know, I had no idea at all that we were even looking at that. Now, this might be because I'm not on cabinet. I don't know whether they know or not. But some of us need quite a lot of time as we, you know, to get heads round. And I mean, I don't think that the IT equipment that we presently get given is up to doing some of the things. I, you know, I've regularly not been able to get something on the iPad and Tim said, go on desktop, it'll work there. Well, that's all right if I'm near a desktop, but not always. And I mean, yeah, cut through iPad out a window. Um, it's been very good. It's had its uses, but those uses are getting slimmer and slimmer at the moment, complicated um, things. And I can't carry the iPad around. So what am I supposed to do? <laughs> that's for me, but it's for anybody with saying. Yeah, and we recognise that, that there's a, a need to ensure that the devices that are being used by members are, are capable of running uh, ModGov. Uh, obviously, the, the upgrade to Office 365 should ensure that uh, all laptop devices are as, uh, as powerful as they need to be to ensure that that is, is capable of doing that. Uh, and certainly iPads that, that, that are used, um, that's the... Um, the way in which they they operate through through an app based system. So um, again, if your iPad isn't uh, performing the way that it should, maybe there's a, an upgrade that's required. So this this move to ModGov will will hopefully ensure that that issues like that are identified and, and resolved, and, and the IT uh, service will ensure that, uh, that that's identified and and hopefully put right. Uh, as far as the um, introduction of ModGov, I think it was dealt with in, in a number of reports uh, towards the back end of, of last year. Certainly Cabinet were, uh, were informed and briefed on that. So uh, it's a system that is used in something like 170 uh, local authorities. So we are benefiting from the learning that's taken place over the last, I think, 10, 12 years. Some authorities have been running this uh, to hopefully have all the, the glitches ironed out of it so that the system that we are uh, we are now using is one that's benefited from, from having uh, real time and, and, and real life ex experience um, put through it. Um, so we, we need to ensure that it works for members and, and, and that is a, a priority, as I said at the beginning, for, uh, for us to work with you and with IT to make sure that the, uh, the transition and the devices that you have are, are working properly and if not, to do something about that. Thank you, Ian. Um, I think we need to give Ian a rest now and give Jackie Addison a chance to do her bit uh, and move on to the Human Resources and Organisational Development uh, oral report from Jackie. 
Councillor Daigle wants to come in. Sorry, Chair. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just trying to aware of it. Sorry, Councillor Dacre, please go, please yeah, fire away. Thank you, Chair. I'll try to be very quick. Um, first, just um, to say from a slightly different perspective about the electoral services, um, I'm a director of a community company which was has a building which was used as a polling station for the first time this year. And I just wanted to say that from that perspective, dealing with electoral services, they were very professional, they were very thorough, they'd had to they obviously had to find some new polling stations this year because some weren't suitable for social distancing and some schools didn't want them. And so they to, came to us and asked us if we could, we could offer them space and we did. And they were very professional in the way in which they dealt with it all. Um, so a thank, a congratulations to them for the hard work they had to do in setting up all the polling stations this time round. And um, secondly, just in relation to the virtual meetings, I think I'm right in that we've, we've fed, there's been a government, well, there is a government consultation into whether or not um, they should bring forward legislation for virtual and or hybrid meetings uh, for councils in the future, which we, along with many other councils, have fed into, um, because I think nearly all councils, again, of all political complexions, would like the ability to carry on with virtual and or hybrid meetings in the future um and so we shall see what happens with that thanks okay sorry i missed you sure, i'll just pick uh, up that last point councillor dake is absolutely right that there's been work done through the the lga uh, and what many councils and i think what we've indicated what we have indicated to the lga is that councils would 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 much prefer to have the ability to choose for themselves which meetings are held either fully physically uh, fully virtually or, or a mixture of, of, of a hybrid process so that we're best placed to decide that based on our the location of our members the uh, the ease of which we have for traveling between the locations that, that we have um, and we should have the, the ability to decide that for ourselves and, and that is what we're, we're advocating for and hopefully there's a, a process that will be picked up as part of that consultation and, and uh, a result that's that's positive at the end of it. It'd be a shame to lose all the learning that, that we've all incurred over the last 15 months. Absolutely. Yeah. Good. I'm going to move on now and give uh, Jackie a chance. Um, this is a follow up to a previous session, I think. Um, one question I wanted to slot in at the beginning, and, and you may be able to answer it straight away, Jackie, is that um, I don't know whether you're going to include a reference to the pay award. Uh, in that I believe local government employees have offered a 1.5% uh, increase, which has been rejected by unions. And if this is the case, is it are we going to factor it into the medium-term financial strategy? Um, and if so, will it require further savings as a result of that? So really just an, an update on that. If you weren't going to include it, please, in terms of the pay award and the issues surrounding that. But far away, please. Good evening, members. Um, would you like me to start with that one, Councillor Ashley? Um, no, one, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. OK, so, yes, you're absolutely right. 1.5% has been offered and rejected. Um, I had a meeting with our respective recognised trade unions this week, all three of them separately, um, and the indication is that they will go to ballot to their members. In mm. terms of how we fund that from a local government perspective, um, Nigel may wish to comment, but um, I'm aware that we didn't budget for it and the requirement has been requested through government to, to support that and fund that. Nigel, did you want to come in there? before I move That's on? that's why I thought as Nigel was here, it was an appropriate thing to include. So Nigel, please, if there's any comment. Uh, yes, as uh, Jack has just said, we didn't budget for a pay award um, based on um, kind of early suggestions that there'll be a pay freeze. Um, so in terms of future years, the impact of that, it will need to be factored into the medium term financial strategy when we redo that in September. In terms of the current year, as I said, there's no budget provision for it. So that will be something that we will need to look at um, whether we can use some of the reserves to cover the current year before it is factored into, um, as I say, the medium term financial strategy for future years. You mentioned that dreadful word reserves again. You go, you're open to more comment, I'm afraid, on that one. But uh, I shall uh, preclude that and ask Jackie to carry on with her full presentation, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I was asked to really um, 
come to this evening just to follow up, as you say, on uh, my recent report a couple of months ago to Strategy and Performance Board, and just to give an update really in terms of where we are on staff wellbeing throughout the pandemic, a um, little bit on resilience and wellbeing um, and the survey that we've just conducted with staff and also the attendance management stats. So um, I'll run through that, but for the for the benefit of Councillor Cook, I didn't know whether I, you want me to just say a little bit about what the HR and OD service covers, just so that Councillor Cook is aware. Would that be helpful? Please, if you can do that briefly, that would be great. Okay. Okay, thank you, Councillor Cook. Uh, so I'm Jackie Addison, I'm the head of HR and OD, and I cover the HR and OD service, which also includes health and safety. Um, so everything that you'd expect is in there, payroll and contracts, advisory, pensions, occupational health. Um, we've got, obviously, recruitment and all the rest of the, the stuff that go with HR. We've also got quite a big traded service that um, we obviously sell out to um, other organisations, including schools, academies, um, private businesses, our partners, uh, and so on. Um, and that's been fairly consistent, really, in terms of the HR offer that we, we put out there. And we're, we're hoping to expand that further this year as well. Uh, we also have a very um, uh, fully supported health and safety traded service as well with schools, academies, uh, and other smaller organisations that are, are interested. Um, so that's a little bit about the HR service. And just to go back to come forward, um, so at the beginning of the pandemic, or just at the, in, around about May time earlier last year, we did um, a wellbeing survey of, around resilience of our staff. And what we've done again this year is, is run the same survey with a few additional questions bolted onto that, that um, we consulted with our employer reference group and our, our uh, network groups, um, our BAME, Equalities Network Group, LGBT, et cetera, disabilities. Um, so we added on a few questions on there as well, just to sort of benchmark where we are in comparison to where we were last year. Um, the, the, the results of that are, are, are currently being um, analysed. So I've not got anything to report on it other than a significant increase in, <coughs> excuse me, the staff that completed it, which is really pleasing. Um, so maybe that's something that you might want to make to report on in the future, Councillor Evans as chair, but I'll leave that to yourselves. Um, so I said this evening, <clears throat> I'm really sorry I've got a sore throat this evening. I said uh, that what I would cover um, is a little bit about the historic bit and that you should have received, um, albeit a little bit late this today, in terms of the absence stats. So strategy and performance have been very interested in um, our absence stats over the period of the last few years. Um, and we've done significant work around that, which I reported on last time in March. Um, and it's really pleasing to note that, you know, the work that's gone on and also ironically in a pandemic, we've managed to achieve what we've been trying to achieve for several years, which is um, to get our stats down to a, an average of eight days per FTE. Just slightly over on that, you'll note from the, the stats that we circulated earlier, uh, 8.13 days per FTE. And during the course of the pandemic, um, the, the amount of... Um, Reduction in stats um, has had, in terms of the total over the 12 months, has averaged 27, 28%. So it's quite significant, really, in terms of that. Um, what's really pleasing to note from, from the stat, early indication from the, the survey is that mental health, depression, well being around that um, has actually dropped the numbers of days, which is very different to the West Yorkshire picture from what I've been reported through the um, through the HR directors meetings. Um, so the amount of wellbeing support that we've put in throughout the pandemic, I think has been really productive. Um, certainly corresponds or correlates with the wellbeing findings from the survey, the initial SIF that I've looked at, um, which is really pleasing to know in terms of the number of days dropped. But I don't think we can rest on our laurels on that one in terms of keeping up with that, refreshing that, I've got some, some ideas for the, for the forthcoming year in terms of how we'll uh, measure that support for staff and ensure that that wellbeing is continuous to be resilient, if you like, because obviously a year of pandemic has been extremely difficult, but to go into a second year, um, you know, staff will obviously need further support that we know about. Um, so that's a little bit on the sickness stats um, and the resilient stuff around that. I don't know if you want me to pause there, Councillor Evans, and see if there are any questions on that firstly. Yeah, so it's a very specific area, isn't it? And I know that the board has been interested in the past. Do uh, yeah. um, members of the board have any particular questions on that subject? 
it looks like you've impressed everybody. Um, <laughs> wishing to be a doubting Thomas, could there be other reasons why for this decline? Um, can we be confident that what we've done has had the has, has been the main effect on on bringing things down? Um, yeah. I think that's a very good point, actually, and, and it has been raised before. What's productivity like? Well, I think productivity is measured by our attendance and also by our objectives and outcomes. Um, and it's really pleasing to know. I mean, just taking a, an example this week, which is it's not insignificant. You know, the, the fact that, for example, customer first team have had 17,000 more calls over the last 16, six months, sorry, compared with last year, um, another 33 percent increase in emails. It's highly significant. On top of that, staff have delivered and been redeployed into different roles, which I covered at my last presentation of Scrutiny Board in March. Um, and, you know, obviously health and social care staff frontline with, along with public health, emergency planning, you know, all the other services that have been out there, um, continuing to deliver that frontline um, role. And then we've got 1,300 staff that have been very quickly transported to working from home within seven days, something that I think one of our directors quoted this week was would have taken us seven years in terms of culture change. Um, and, you know, the, the, the amount of support that we've received, I know that sometimes IT get bad press, but, you know, they've been fantastic. We've got redeployed staff from our public services directorate and others into um, various jobs to support the pandemic, to support the vaccination, um, program that supported the um, the local doctor surgeries in terms of you know getting people through that um, and also redeploy them into things like the homeless hub um, and various other services that have, have ongoing. So I think you know somebody quoted this week that you know staff have worked flat out and I think all credit um, to to the productivity that's been achieved over the last twelve months. And as sort of Nigel's covered earlier on in his presentation about some of these staff are doing two roles in terms of keeping their substantive role going and paying out the grants on top of, as Councillor Baker referred to, you know the additional support, the additional work. And um, some of these staff had never worked in different roles. You know, let's take for example the public services, sports services side you know, redeployed into various roles that they've never done before, IT, the new skills that they've adapted and learned from various colleagues across the, the piece of sort of mentored them into doing things. Um, and I think all credit to them, really, you know, we've continued to deliver the services. Nobody's noted, a, you know, a reduction in services. In fact, what we've done is increase that. Um, so, you know, I would say, yes, uh, productivity is up. I would say that the, the interesting stats on sickness absence that have reduce significantly are your common, believe it or not, your common cold, sore throat, viruses, because people, 1,300 staff are not in the office, coming in with us, spreading them, that turn <laughs> into something more severe. So, mm. you know, that could have, you know, an, an impact, could have, will, will has had an impact in terms of the reduction in stats. Um, so, yeah, I would say, um, I would probably pass that question out and say, well, have you as members, have the public noted a reduction in services? Um, I would, I would say not, you know, if anything, we've continued to supply the services and more um, supporting vulnerable staff, clinically shielding, you know, clinically vulnerable staff, those that were shielding, delivering to people's homes at the beginning when there wasn't the um, shopping facilities available online, etc. cetera. Um, so, no, I would probably say, you know, I would argue that the fact that staff have been more productive in this time. But fair, fair enough. I think, Megan, did you want to come in on that one? Or... You're on mute, Councillor Swift. I know, I'm trying. Oh. <laughs> I'm trying. Or, or as some people would say, very trying. <laughs> um, I am not, I'm not trying to belittle the job that anybody has done. But did you say 17,000 more inquiries to customer first? 17,000 17, calls over the last six months, um, our um, um, Assistant Director of Customer Service, Sarah, Sarah Richardson, who Actually, I think might be on this call as actually reported in the public services highlights in the past um, few days. Um, and I think that's significant, isn't it, you know, in terms of the numbers? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, the one that I'm exaggerating slightly with, but it's felt like this sometimes, is the 16,000 of those 17,000 who've complained about not getting calls back. It has been regular. Mind you, that's highways as well. 
uh, it has been a regular thing for people to say. And I've been on to them three times. And they're really nice, but nobody comes back to me. Now, that could be a time issue, but, you know, it needs just to be checked on. Well, I'm sure Sarah will take that offline with you, Councillor Swift, at, at some point. But um, you know, we do, we do, we have received a number of compliments about the the, the service that's been received for the customer services as well. Of course, you can't please everybody, and you know, delayed because of the volume. Obviously, the delayed in, in answering calls, etc., is is probably an issue as well. Um, Councillor Baker would like to come in with a quick comment, Chair. I don't yeah. know if you've seen that in the chat. Yes, thank you. Yeah. No, I think it's just when members are finished, mm. I'll come in then, if that's okay. Yep. You can summarise for us, of it, Sylvia. Carry on, please, Jackie. Mm -hmm. um, so, so in terms of that item, I, I finished that item. Does, does Councillor Dacre want to comment on that item before I move on to anything further that uh, members want to hear? Okay, yeah. It was, it was just to say, really, that... Um, Again, because this is within my portfolio, I'd just like to say I've been impressed by the way in which the council have been able to respond to HR issues which have arisen for staff when they had to start working from home very quickly. And it has thrown up various problems. And I think the council has done a really good job of holding staff webinars and having other lines of communication which have enabled staff to raise problems when they've arisen and um, therefore the council to try to deal with those and that I think has also helped in um, forming the approach that the council's going to take in the future as to how it looks at the whatever we want to call it the blended um, system of work that we have in the future um, how we mix the office and the home working and, and I think the council's to be congratulated on the work it's done in that area. And if anybody hasn't attended the staff webinars, I've watched some of them and I think they've been very useful to see. The, to see, to me, the most encouraging thing is the fact that the staff have been quite fearless in asking questions and it hasn't just been a case of managers communicating to staff and staff sitting there. Staff have been asking sometimes quite challenging questions and getting answers and I think that's a sign of a healthy workplace. Thank you, Sylvia. Do you want to carry on, Jackie? Yeah, so whilst we're on that subject, I'll just cover that a little bit more, um, Councillor Dacre, if that's OK. Um, so what these webinars, it was um, our Chief Executive, Robin, that uh, suggested that we do these webinars uh, for staff, an all-staff webinar where staff dial in and basically uh, we answer questions that are voted up by the staff. Um, and then afterwards, what we're doing is doing an FAQ on all the questions so that eventually all, this, all, the, all the questions that have been asked uh, will be answered but we only get we, we have an hour you see on on these webinars and um, they've been extremely well attended extremely well received by staff and staff want more of them we're about to do another one um next week which is on the it service which um the director of public services is leading on uh, zora senkudi and the uh, two it uh, corporate leads which are john smith and uh, craig chumildi so that's one next week and then we're looking to do one around about the 21st of June, another all staff webinar on the HR and health and wellbeing and resilience survey and doing a feedback on that, which will coincide obviously with potentially the um, relaxation of further, um, if that happens. Um, so timely event really around that as well. Um, and they've been really well attended and the, the feedback that we've got from staff as part of the um, bits of the survey that I've seen have been really positive. They want more of that and less of the written communication so that they can come on and be a bit more interactive. Um, so we shall keep and build on, uh, keep building on those um, and to provide those for staff uh, as part of the, the approach that we're doing. And then just to pick up what Councillor Dacre has just mentioned about the uh, planned approach to change. And as we all know, our organisation has, has been through enormous change over the last 12 months. And it's come completely transformed the way that the organisation and many of us have operated as has been alluded to this evening with regard to webinar teams etc um, and um, Zoom calls um, and obviously this has created so many challenges for us uh, but also generated many opportunities which we hope to capture and expand on, magnify um, post the pandemic and, and obviously the learning, the incredible amount of learning that has been achieved in this period is just phenomenal. So, you know, I've mentioned earlier, who'd have thought we'd have had 1300 staff working from home 
uh, at the drop of a hat and all credit to IT colleagues for getting us to this stage. Um, and as part of the recovery process that has also been, been mentioned this evening, uh, both as, as an organisation and supporting the borough as a whole, we want obviously to get back on our feet. Um, inevitably, we've got you know, quite a number of changes to go through um, and adjustments to services moving forward on to online applications, for example, cashless payments to major changes that will affect many staff and service users, um, such as council's workplace, <coughs> office accommodation strategy. So we're looking at a blended approach, but let's not forget all those colleagues that have continued to provide those frontline services throughout this pandemic. Um, and, and that measured approach that we're taking forward. So what the survey will hopefully give us uh, will be a rich picture of what staff would like to see in terms of what they want to retain and how you know, we can move forward. And not everybody, it's not all positive, not all staff want to work from home. Uh, and we need to make sure that there's a blended approach and that we try to accommodate where possible uh, the disparity or the differences between what staff need and want going forward. And as Councillor has mentioned this evening about the IT equipment and have we got the right information, have staff got the right equipment, etc. All the well-being and the, the health and safety side of things have got to be uh, obviously continued to uh, ensure risk assessments are done, DSE assessments are done. Um, so all that's being currently uh, consulted on uh, with staff, with trade unions, and, and the, the plan is to not to do this to staff, but to, you know, to be part of this. And our employee reference group that we set up during the pandemic, which any staff member can volunteer to be on. Um, we meet, uh, it's chaired, co-chaired by myself and the Director of Public Health, um, Debs Harkins, and this is where staff are feeding back this rich information about how they're feeling um, and you know, their well-being. And it's certainly in my 30 plus years as I've never seen change like it. And, and also the staff that are with us on this that are feeding back. And as Councillor Dick has just alluded to, not frightened of, of commenting, which is what we want. We want to make this, we want, don't want to do this to staff. We want to bring them with us and, and continue to build on the good practices that we've adopted so far. Would you like me to pause there in case there are any further queries? I've not got much further to cover, think, really, if I'm honest. I think, was it uh, Councillor Cook, Jacob, were you indicating at one point? Yes, yeah, certainly. I uh, just wanted to, well, congratulations for managing to get 1,300 staff working from home. I, I can imagine that must have been a logistical nightmare. But I just wanted to ask, how many of the staff are still working from home? The same. We've still got the same amount of staff working from home. Some some staff have come back into the workplace where there have been difficulties for very personal reasons or for varied reasons where we've got teams that can't do the job, obviously, from home. We've had to bring those back in um, and our services have reopened following the uh, lifting of the restrictions, etc. Uh, we've got further openings over the bank holiday weekend from museums had the pools and swimming and, and um, the leisure centre reopen etc so as services have started to come back online um, or, or reopen we've been able to bring staff back in but by and large the majority of staff are still working from home um, and we'll review that later on once we get past this resilience uh, survey and we get the feed the rich feedback and we're able to adapt the workplace and and take that forward through the, the past steering group that's the people the assets um, and the and the services uh, group that has been set up really to review all that um, and make sure that we incorporate the feedback from staff as part of that plan. So is, is the idea to give staff the option if you want to carry on working from home, they can do? Uh, or, or is your objective to get all staff back to where they used to be pre, pre-COVID? No, right, so it's the former, not the latter, but with uh, yeah. obviously some parameters around that in terms of looking at the assets of the buildings that we've got and really looking at rationalising those. What do we need going forward? Like many organisations have done, I think it's nationwide that have just announced 17,000 of their staff will work very differently. They'll not come back to the office. They'll be working from hubs. They'll be working mm. from branches and they'll be working from home. So a blended approach, we're calling it Calderdale. Um, so, yeah, we're looking at a kind of blended approach that it won't just transfer back and there are talk of one in five days in the office or two in five or something like that there's nothing in tablets of stone at this moment in time apart from you know we have looked at obviously taking this forward because in terms of savings it will help us to uh, to address some of the uh, deficits that we've had over the period of time and a lot of staff don't want to go back to working full-time in the office some do and let's not forget those I think we've just got to listen to staff and and keep consulting really is my advice on that one yeah, Thank you. Sorry, are you okay with that one? Uh, 
Jacob. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Certainly, yeah, just wanted to ask that ask that question. But I think it's a good idea to use the opportunity of COVID to to uh, like you say adopt a different uh, approach to where the staff work. So I think it's a very good idea that. Mm. So well uh, it's, done. Yeah. it's going to have an ongoing impact in terms of things like office accommodation and so on, isn't it? Yeah, um, but I think the, the watchword has to be flexibility and the recognition that some people are uh, have different needs in terms of working. Um, we also, all of us, need at some time, I still think, some face-to-face -face contact with people. And this, this is fine, but it's not quite the same as sat around a table with somebody. And I think there's always going to be a need for so it's dangerous to make that sweeping generalisation, isn't it? But I think there's going to be a need to contain and have that. And it might be, as you say, one, two days, three days a week in the office or booking slots, I don't know, and back, even more extended hot desking to, oh, I don't know, all sorts of things, but yeah. not necessarily appropriate here. Um, just a question on the, this resilience survey report that's coming through. That will come back to us or to generally to uh, uh, councillors? So it'll go to corporate leadership team um, once the anal analysis has been done and then to cabinet. And then if you'd like me to report that through to scrutiny, yeah. then I can do so. Um, we want to obviously consult with staff on that to tell them you said we did. And, you know, that's what the <laughs> webinar is going to be about as well, really, to give feedback to staff on you know, what, what has that told us as an organisation? And, you know, we want to listen to obviously what they're saying. Um, just to go back to one of the points that Councillor Cook mentioned, the general principle is that members, of, that each member of staff will be given the opportunity to work from an office at least one day a week. Um, and it may be different office to where they are working from, where they were working from previously. Um, for example, I my closest council building is Brighouse Library. I, I've often gone in there, generally on a weekend, um, and it's a lovely place to work. That might be, you know, a nearest spot for somebody else, etc. So it's about get, finding a blended approach, really, to how people want to or how we can work in the future. So that might be an opportunity to uh, reopen libraries and things like that, because we can use them as. Uh, oh. <laughs> Sorry, it's a little obvious. <laughs> I'm not opening that debate, Councillor Evans. <laughs> uh, uh, um, so, yeah, so it's a flexibility. Working patterns will vary according to customer and service needs and individual preferences is what, I suppose, what we've been saying, you know, all along really as part of this reconfiguration. Okay. So we're yeah. looking at reconfiguring spaces now, you know, in Princess buildings, etc. So that works ongoing. We've got equipment being delivered as we speak for shielders you know shielding desks etc to make oh, sure yes. they're safe etc so yeah okay so i think i've covered everything that you asked me to cover tonight i don't know whether megan was indicating were you there megan wanted to come in on any of that you need to uh, unmute again i don't know who wants to answer this for me but but it's definitely come up again. Where do members come into all this? Because I thought, and some of the constituents that go out and vote for us, don't think it's officers, think it's us. And that's why they yell at us when we're not at the door. And, you know, I, I believe from the leader of the council that there was not much um, communication with members at the beginning of this process, which is understandable because at that point, it was urgent and et cetera, et cetera. But it just sounds as though we're going to do the same thing again. Well, that point has been raised. I don't know whether Ian wants to come in at some point, but if I just take the first bit, that point was raised by the chief executive at corporate leadership team and Alan Lee is going to pick that up, I believe. Um, Ian, did you want to say any more on that? I don't know if you any, know any more in terms of the consultation with members. I know it was raised at corporate leadership team a couple of weeks ago, mm -hmm. wasn't it? I think that's right, Jackie. Um, I think as far as, as communication with members uh, through the past 15 months, I mean, I'm very much aware that every Friday I go through a, a member's briefing that's, that goes out and has gone out um, without exception every single week with, I think, comprehensive information about, yeah. about where we are with various I'm aspects. I'm sorry, Ian, can I, can I just interrupt? because I'm being, I'm being made feel really guilty for asking questions at the moment. And we know you've done, the vast majority of things that the council has done and their staff have done uh, has been brilliant. You know, not doubting that at all. It's just the, well, I don't know. What's the point being a councillor if you're only told what officers are doing and not being asked if you should do it? Yeah. I should have 
Sorry, Kamsa, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not sure the point you're making about not being asked about something. Um, you work in as, as councillors, Megan. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 quite often. Uh, and I mean, I doubt there's any councillors here that if they've been honest, wouldn't think the same thing. But I mean, I will mute it now. I'll put something in writing here and I think that's probably better. Okay, thank you. Yep. We'll, we'll let you do that then and be interested in the result. Jackie, any, any other comments you wish to make? Um, I don't think so. Um, in terms of priorities for the HR service, they've not changed since I reported in March, um, you know, in terms of um, tackling inequalities. Um, it's a priority for the whole HR and OD service and across council. Uh, increasing apprenticeships as we, re we reset and we try and tackle those individuals that have been most affected, that 18 to 24 bracket. I'm looking at inter internships, increasing apprenticeships, growing our own and, and developing our workforce that are going to be fit uh, for the future in terms of training, etc. cetera. Um, and then obviously I've mentioned about the core with the priority in terms of health and safety, well-being, DSC assess assessments. I don't think there's anything further to say on that. Um, and then the significant cultural change that I've talked about as well. So that's kind of my main priorities this year for the HR and OD. So. Good, thank you. Any, any questions from, uh, from members? I can't see anybody indicating, I don't think. So I think it remains to thank Jackie for that. Thank you very much. Much appreciated. And... Uh, move on to the final item on the agenda, which is the work programme. Is this something that you want to kick off, uh, Mike, on uh, the work programme content? Uh, <clears throat> uh, 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 thank you, Chair. I mean, I mean, Lauren has done all the work on the, on the work programme and managed Sorry, to do it effectively. Um, I guess we picked up two or three things from the discussion this evening that, that members have indicated they might like to come back. And I uh, you know, would welcome any comments now or, or at any time by email or telephone from members about the work programme and Lauren and I will work together to to pick up the issues that have been raised this evening and bring back a, a revised programme for the next meeting. Yeah I'd, I'd echo the importance of uh, uh, scrutiny board members uh, you know, thinking about this on an ongoing basis and throw them back to Mike, Lauren, myself or Bob or whatever uh, and, and see if there are issues which are coming up which we feel we should be looking at uh, to, to slot in. Is there anything in particular at this point that people wish to mention? Not getting any indications. So can we leave that with Lauren and uh, Mike for now and we'll keep an eye on that. Bob, have you anything else that you, you wanted to add in from uh, as uh, Deputy Chair on this one? Well, no, other than the ones I think Mike's already picking up on yeah. the one I spoke Good. about earlier on. I'm particularly wanting to Get up to speed on 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 what the previous in-depth scrutiny uh, was happening with this uh, uh, with this board on, on green spaces, and I understood that was intended to be part of uh, that. So that green space was intended to be part of a series of other things that they were, that were wanting to investigate at scrutiny. Yeah, okay. yeah, I think it's a really important one to include. We need some update about what, just what's happening and where we are with that. Perhaps we could uh, get that, uh, Lauren, um, Mike, spread around. Good. Apart from that, thank you one and all for the no, meeting. Councillor, Councillor, um, Councillor Evans, uh, I need Councillor Porritt and Councillor Press to um, ratify the uh, minutes. They were the only two that were present at, at the previous minutes. Thank you for the reminder. Happy to do right, so. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Happy to thank do that. Much. Thanks for the reminder. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Good. Thank you one and all and good night.